coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. When Jesus asked the Pharisees whose son was the Christ, he had them cornered. This is the place where everything shifted in the spirit realm. This one scripture, everything shifted. There was no denying what they had just confessed with their own mouths. The Messiah, he is the son of David. They did not know what Jesus was about to hit them with from their own law. If the Christ is supposed to be, is supposed to only be the son of David, then why did David call his son Lord? This question ties both the physical and the spiritual identity together in one person. And only one person could fulfill both. And that was Jesus. Welcome to Keys to Kingdom Living. I'm your host, Pastor Ace Dockery, the senior pastor of War Harvest Church North, located in beautiful North Georgia. We're so excited to be able to share the Word of God with you on a weekly basis. And today we're bringing you the second part of the message we began last week. It's entitled, Son of David. There is so much in this Word, I don't want to take long introducing it. I just want you to get out the Word of God, go with me, and let's hear what the Spirit is saying to us about the title, Son of David. Check it out. Others who seem to know him, as to, in this account, trying to find what Jesus' identity really was. Isn't that interesting? Who is this man? How is it that he does these things? How is it the heavens open up and voice comes out saying, this is my beloved son? Who is this guy? Why was there so much controversy surrounding Jesus' identity? Was he the king of the Jews? Or was he just the son of Joseph and Mary who happened to be a good prophet, as they just said right here? Why were the chief priests and scribes displeased, indignant, with the good things that Jesus did for the suffering people? He cleared out all the money changers' tables. He ran the thieves out of the temple. And he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, right? And after he did that, he began healing all that were sick among them. He set things in order in the house of God, did he not? And to this, the, the chief priests and the scribes were indignant. Here he is doing good to the people, healing them, being a shepherd, if you will, to the people of Israel. And the chief priest get sideways with him. Jesus went about doing good to all, but the religious leaders went about threatening and persecuting him. But for what reason did they do this? It is in this story we read where the Jews called Jesus the son of David. When the leaders, get this, when the leaders heard the Jews calling Jesus son of David, this caused them to become displeased, New King James says, indignant with Jesus. But why? It's just a title. The genealogy has already been traced. People know that he is a descendant of David. So why does it upset these religious leaders, these re religious zealots, if you would, that, he, that the Jews are now beginning to call Jesus son of David? Look there in Matthew 20, verse 29. Now, as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Get this. He has a great multitude following him. This is amazing, is it not? And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out saying, here it comes, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet but they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, 
that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. These two blind men cried out to Jesus, calling him Son of David, and asked him to have mercy on them. As they shouted to Jesus, what did the crowd do? They tried to shut them up, silence them. They rebuked them and said, be quiet. Once again, there's controversy stirred up over his identity. Look there in Matthew 15, 22. And behold, a, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed, but he answered her not a word. Now, in every other instance, he has compassion and he heals them. But now this woman comes, has a daughter that's demon-possessed severely, and says, Have mercy on me, on my daughter, and he does nothing. Why? Has he grown cold all of a sudden? No. She's a Gentile. She's from Canaanite. The enemies of Israel. So he answered her not a word. And his, enemy, his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. Sounds like a good church to attend. She has a problem, send her away. She wants us to do something for her. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he, he explains why he's doing what he's doing. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Did she cop an attitude with him? No, she didn't. She humbled herself. There's only one reason you would humble yourself to someone who's treating you with disdain like they're treating her. She believes in him. When you really believe in God, you will keep humbling yourself until you get what you want from God. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. So she said, Yes, Lord. Faith without, uh, without faith, no one can please God. That word please means to agree. She said, yes, Lord. She came into agreement, didn't she? Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, watch this, and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. That's a powerful story of faith, perseverance. You persevere. You don't let stuff that contradicts God's word keep you from getting what God promises. Now, this, as I stated earlier, was not a Jewish woman, but she was a Gentile crying to Jesus. But here's the interesting part about this. Though she was not a Jew, she still identified Jesus as son of David. Isn't that interesting? And asked son of David, have mercy on me. Not only did the Jews refer to Jesus as son of David, but also now Gentiles. Look there in Matthew 13, 54. It says in verse 54, speaking of Jesus, And when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and all these mighty works? Well, I suppose he went to Walmart and got it. Do you see the disdain, the, the contempt they have toward Jesus? He's doing these mighty things. He's speaking wisdom that they had never heard any other man utter out his lips. And they look at him and say, where did he get this stuff? But look at verse 55. This will show what's in their heart. Is this not the carpenter's son? Whoa. Is this not Joseph's son and is not uh, his mother called Mary and his brothers, are they not here? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. He's doing miracles, y'all. Isn't that interesting? He's casting out devils. He, he's healing sick daughters of Gentile women. He's doing good to all that ask of him. 
and in return, they get offended at him. That's a fine how do you do. And Jesus said to them, here it comes, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. See, when people don't honor God in their heart, they won't God honor the God in you either when you're doing everything that God told you to do. So don't try to please people. Don't listen to them who get offended to you because you're doing what God said and you're identifying with God and not them. Now, verse 58. Now, he did not do many mighty works because of their unbelief in his own country. Now, even though Jesus spoke with authority like no other and performed mighty miracles in their midst, they refused to acknowledge Jesus as being anything more than Joseph's and Mary's son. Think about that. He had done in their midst things that no other man had ever done. And the best they could do is say, is this not the carpenter's son? And is not his mother Mary and his siblings here with us? And because of they dishonored Jesus in his own country, it tied the anointing and he could not do mighty works for them. That's sad, isn't it? How many churches in America, the pastor is preaching their heart out under the anointing of God, and people are sitting in the pews with their arms folded, dishonoring the anointing that's on that man or woman's life, and God would set them free in the audience, but because they will not honor the anointing, God can do nothing in their midst. Why was it that some Jews and Gentiles called Jesus the son of David, but the masses saw Jesus as only being the son of Joseph and Mary? There was a spiritual war about to erupt where two worlds were about to collide. The kingdom of God was about to overtake the kingdom of darkness. How do you know that? Well, turn with me to 2 Samuel, I'll show you. There's fixing to be a collision here in Jerusalem and all of Israel that was going to turn the world upside down. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. God is speaking through Nathan the prophet, the son of David, the biological son. And this is what the prophet is saying. Now therefore, thus, say, thus shall you say to my servant David. David has uh, proposed to God to build him a house. He said, I, I'm in a house of cedar, but you, Lord, your ark is in a, a tent. Let me build for you a house. This is God's reply to David's request. Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all, how many? All your enemies from before you and have made you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people, Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you, re you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Here's a star beside verse 13, meaning it's a messianic prophecy. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? That's a lot longer than four years. I will establish, God will establish this throne of his kingdom forever I will be his father and he will be my son 
If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with uh, the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established. How long? Forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. He swore this to David about his throne. While his predecessor Saul was, re, was dethroned and removed from the kingdom. But God here establishes David's throne as being the throne that will per perpetuate for eternity. Instead of the Jews asking for a king here in this story, it is God who has chosen himself, David, as the king that he will use to bring his son, Jesus, and his kingdom into the earth since David was a man after God's own heart. David means lovely or to have love, the name David. David loved God with all his heart. When he was king, he took care of the people because he loved the people. He protected them. He was a good king to the people. And because of this love and because he had a heart for God, God established his throne forever. And he says, through your seed, this throne will be established and this kingdom will be established forever for my people. Therefore, from this prophecy that I just read you, all Jews, all Jews knew there would come a king that would also be, get this, a descendant of King David whom God had chosen to rule over Israel and over his kingdom forever. This was the messianic prophecy that introduced the title, Son of David. So whenever anyone called Jesus by this title, the religious leaders knew they were calling Jesus the Messiah. Isn't that powerful? Now you understand, whenever those that needed mercy called on him, called him the son of David, the, the religious zealots, the hard-hearted men, the whitewashed sepulchers that were full of dead men's bones, they, they said, stop it. Don't speak that name over him because he's just son of Joseph. But when the Jews heard it, and when they saw what Jesus did and when that woman from Canaan came and, and heard what Jesus could do, they knew it. There was something inside of them that said, this is not just Joseph's son, this is the son of David. And when they said that, what they were saying was, this is the Messiah, the son of the living God. It was this particular title or name that caused so much conflict between the leaders of Israel and Jesus during his entire three-and-a-half-year ministry. Turn with me to Matthew 22 as we wrap this up. You see, the Lord had me take you through Scripture to bring this nugget of revelation that was buried in Scripture out. To let you understand as a Christian, you as a church understand that if Jesus was God incarnate and he had to fight the religious systems of the world to prove his identity as son of the living God and to establish his authority through all that he said and all that he did, then we too are going to have to prove our identity by the way we live. You shall know them by their fruit. They slap you on the face, turn the other cheek. They sue you, take your coat, give them your cloak also. They ask you to go a mile, walk with them twain, two. Don't just... Bless your friends. Pray for your enemies. Bless those that despitefully use you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. Yeah. 
Matthew 22, 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, oh, I love this, saying, what do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? He's asking the very ones that hate for him to be called son of David. And he asked them, what do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? Without them thinking what they were saying, they said to him, the son of David. So he said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? If, if the Christ, the Messiah, is the son of David, how is it David in the spirit or by the spirit calls his son Lord? God. The Lord, then he quotes Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one, and I mean no one, was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare ask Jesus anything else. <laughs> he shut them down. Here it is. When Jesus asked the Pharisees whose son was the Christ, he had them cornered. This is the place where everything shifted in the spirit realm. This one scripture, everything shifted. There was no denying what they had just confessed with their own mouths. The Messiah, he is the son of David. They did not know what Jesus was about to hit them with from their own law. If the Christ is supposed to be, is supposed to only be the son of David, then why did David call his son Lord? This question ties both the physical and the spiritual identity together in one person. And only one person could fulfill both. And that was Jesus. It meant that the Messiah would both be son of man and son of God. You can't be Lord unless you're from God. And you cannot be son of David unless you're man. And in this revelation, Jesus was illustrating to them that this one question ties both together, the physical identity, the physical realm, with the spiritual identity and the spiritual realm together in one person. It meant that the Messiah would be both the Son of Man and the Son of God. He would be both flesh and spirit. With this one question, Jesus forced the, the leaders of Israel's religion to make a choice either to accept that he was the Son of David and the Lord or deny it. And they chose in the face of truth they could not argue with. Can you imagine that? He gave them such unarguable truth. I don't even know if that's a word. They could not stand against it. They could not resist it. It was so pure a truth and so established as truth, they could not refute it, but they would not accept it. It will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than it will be for them. This one question completely shut them up. They walked away knowing, get this, knowing he was the Messiah, but pride wouldn't let them admit it. Turn with me to Revelation 22. You have endured to the end. Just helped you today. Revelation 22, verse 16. This is Jesus speaking. We know it's Jesus because it says it's Jesus and it's written in red. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. 
This is the completion of the revelation of the son of David. Jesus himself tells us that not only is he the offspring of David, the son of David, but he is also the root of David. He's the root of David. If you're a root, that means you're underground. You were the beginning. Do you remember in John 8 when, the, when Jesus says uh, to the Jews, says, continue with me in my word. You shall be my disciples. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they says, well, how can you say we will be made free? Because we've never, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. And they go on and argue and argue and argue and then. And Jesus gets down there and he says, Before Abraham was, I am. Remember that? Before Abraham was, I am. Here he is saying, I'm not only the offspring of David, I am the root of David. Before David was, I am. Jesus didn't get his beginning with David, but it was David that got his beginning with Jesus, the Messiah, the Word before it was made flesh. Jesus is the son of David because he is the Lord of all. Well, I hate to cut it short there, but we're out of time. But before I leave you, I want to encourage you, if you didn't get to watch the first part of this, you can go on our website and check it out. Or if you'd like a DVD, you can go on the information at the bottom of the screen and order from our church office a DVD or a CD, and you can have that in your library, and you can pull that out. There's so much truth in this word that God give us to let us know beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus is more than the son of Mary. He's more than the son of David. He is the son of the living God. And that's just so encouraging and builds our confidence in God's word that if Jesus is the son of God, then his word is truth, and his truth will move the mountains out of our way. That's why I encourage you every week, after you hear the word and the faith is built up, send us your prayer request and let us agree in prayer and let us stand and see these mountains in your way be moved out of the way through the power of God's grace and strength that's on your life and the life of this ministry. So please send those in. You can send an email to us or you can call it in. All that information is at the bottom of the screen. We want to thank you if you've been a faithful viewer and uh, for watching. We want to ask you to take the next step become a supporter of this ministry we would love to hear from you we could use your help to get this voice out to the nations of the world people love it they love the truth and that's what we're all about will you help us get a, this message out to more stations more people for the glory of god we're, we're grateful to god for you and for you watching we're praying and agreeing with you god's going to move those mountains till this time next week may god richly bless you as our prayer we pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 